Hello, my name is Frank Crawford. I'm president of Crawford & Associates, which is a CPA firm based here in Oklahoma City that specializes in governmental accounting, auditing, and consulting. Uh, I'm very familiar with Oklahoma cities and towns in that I have now entered my 30th year of providing services, accounting-wise, uh, to Oklahoma municipalities. I get asked many times, why did you choose accounting when you went to college? And actually, uh, I was a little bit of a, a trick. Uh, what, what happened was that I went in to see my advisor on day one of the school, and the advisor said, well, what is it that you want to do with your life? And I said, well, I, I really want to be a game show host. And he looked a little puzzled at me, and he said, well, we don't have a major for game show hosting. And I said, well, then put me in something that's the next closest thing. So they stuck me in accounting. And then in about year three, I realized they had pulled a very cruel joke on me and that now it was too late to change my major and I'm stuck with accounting. So very humorous story. It's actually partly true, uh, but I uh, have certainly uh, stuck with it. And uh, we have a firm now that is located here in Oklahoma City and has about 25 employees that provide uh, accounting and auditing services to state and local governments. So. What we're going to do today for the mayors that are watching is we're going to talk about accounting. And I know that that's really kind of dull and boring and doesn't sound very exciting. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a tip where I've prepared on a big cardboard sheet that I'm going to hold up here in a minute. The secret equation to understand all accounting. It's very complicated. It's very difficult. So that's why I'm going to hold it up. And you may want to get a pen and pencil and write this down. But I'm going to grab the sign and hold it up now and basically explain that if you can get this equation, beginning with 1, adding 10, subtracting 10, and ending with 1, then you can understand every aspect of the world of accounting I'm going to throw at you. Because this is what accounting is all about. We begin with a number. In this case, it's a 1. Maybe uh, it's a 2. Maybe it's a minus 4. But we usually begin a period with something whether it's the beginning of the day, the beginning of the year, the beginning of the month, we start with something. You use words like beginning cash, beginning fund balance, uh, beginning reserves. Uh, whatever the term is, it's, it's relatively unanimous. It, it stands for something that we're carrying forward from the previous period. During the year or during this period, we will collect or earn revenues, which is the first 10 in the equation. We will then appropriate and spend those revenues, and then we will let math take over and produce the ending number for the period, which then would magically roll to the bottom of the slide and become the beginning number of the next period, and we start the equation all over again. And that's basically the world of accounting. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a budget, whether we're talking about an audit, it's all the same. We begin with something, we add to it, we spend it, and then math takes over and produces an ending number and we call it all kinds of different things uh, in the world of accounting but at the end of the day it's simply what is left over that we can then use to help subsidize the revenue stream from the next year. And so where we get into a little bit of trouble is on the back of this slide when the equation looks a little bit weird. Perhaps you start with 1, you add 10 and then you spend 12. Well, if you're doing math correctly, that ends with a negative one. Here's another big tip in the world of accounting. If there is a number that has a minus sign in front of it, or a number with brackets around it, it's bad. So repeat after me, brackets are bad. We can have t-shirts made up or something if you like. Brackets around a number don't signify anything good. In this situation, what this is telling us is that we have a beginning reserve of about $1. One dollar out of ten is about ten percent. So we start with a dollar, we earn ten more, we spend twelve, and now we have a negative one dollar as our ending number, which would then force us to go to the next period and start with that negative one as our beginning number. And if we continue that equation and we overspend our revenue stream again, you'll notice that we're digging a deeper hole. That deeper hole is simply called a deficit. And so that's it. That's the magic of accounting. When you see an audit, when you see a budget, you're going to see numbers that represent the two tens in the equation, and you're going to see numbers that represent the beginning and ending, 
math of what happened with those numbers plus the beginning number. And whether they call it a balance sheet, an income statement, an operating statement, a statement of activities, a statement of net position, it doesn't matter. It all works in this same equation. And that's the key to understanding everything that comes from this point forward. Because if you don't get these equations, especially this one, this is the way we want it to look. Because in this scenario, basically what we're doing is we're starting with a number that we carried forward from the previous year. We're adding to that number with new revenue. We're spending that revenue and we're ending with the same number. A balanced budget, if you use that, those terms. The ending and beginning numbers really don't change. We live off of the current revenue stream. It's when we have the reverse of this is when we get into a little bit of trouble. How much money are we leaving over? In this scenario, it's, it's a one, it's 10%. Is a 10% reserve enough cushion? Well, it depends on who you listen to. Uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, which was a, a group of individuals that have formed uh, uh, an association of finance directors throughout the, uh, of the country, uh, recommend that at a minimum reserve or fund balance, we ought to have about 10%. Well, that's what this equation represents. But remember, that minimum reserve is a minimum. It's not a maximum. It's not sufficient. Uh, in our professional opinion, I think you might want to be double that 10%. So with that as our framework for the world of accounting, let's move on and talk about a couple of other things. Let's talk about Oklahoma specifically. We'll talk about uh, Oklahoma municipalities versus what we call Oklahoma public trusts. Many of you that are now mayors and maybe the mayors for the first time will find that you're not just the mayor of a town or a mayor of a city, but you've also been named as the chief trustee or the chairman of the board of what's called the public works authority or the utility authority. All that simply is, is a branch of the city that has been broken off into its own separate legal entity and those that serve on the governing body of the city council most likely serve as the trustees of that public trust. And that, what that public trust does is specifically operate most of the time a specialized function. In many cases it's usually utilities, but I've seen airports, golf courses, um, all types of business type activities that are ran uh, through what we call these public trusts. They're treated very differently from the world of accounting. The city side, which is governed by Oklahoma Statutes Title 11, basically has very strict requirements to it, uh, from competitive bidding to the preparation of the budgets to having audits done. Whereas the public trust side might have a little bit more strict procurement policies, but everything else they do seems to be much looser. In other words, a public trust can go and issue debt uh, without having to go to a vote of the people whereas a city is not allowed to incur an obligation that will go beyond the current period that it's in. And so in order for utility systems to expand by borrowing money, years and years ago, probably in the early 1940s, 1950s, uh, attorneys helped the municipalities of Oklahoma create what we call these Title 60 public trusts. And the reason I'm letting you know this is because you'll find yourself as not only the mayor of this town, but literally the mayor or chairman of the board of many of these type of trusts. And the trust rules are different, so you can't apply the city rules to those of the trusts. One of the main issues that uh, we see uh, that is quite different is, is related to the budget. Under Title 11 budgeting, under city budgeting, we actually have a choice of two methods for the lack of creativity that we accountants have. We call them the old budget law and the new budget law, even though the new budget law was adopted, I believe, in 1979. The old budget law is very simple. It's almost a cash basis budget. It basically says, look at what you uh, earned in revenue last year, and then I want you to appropriate next year 10% less than that. So you had to actually collect a certain amount of money then you're allowed to multiply that number by 90% and that's what you can appropriate in the next year. It's a very conservative methodology. Small towns, small uh, municipalities, those are the ones that typically utilize that old budget law. 
as you grow and your, your need to expand or grow the city or the public trusts grows, then you'll find that many governments will switch to what we call the new budget law, which again, not really new from 1979. And literally what it says is, why don't you just estimate as a revenue what you actually think you're gonna collect next year? We're not gonna limit you to 90% of what you actually collected the year before, because if you know that there's a new penny sales tax or that there's a new grant coming in, you ought to be allowed to appropriate that in, for example, your two tens that we showed in our mathematical equation early. If I know that first 10 is really gonna be a 12, I ought to show a 12 and not be limited to what I should uh, have only collected 90% of in the year before. So those trusts, again, very different from the city, very different rules, and from the budget perspective, the trust doesn't really have to do all of that fancy budgeting that we just talked about. It only has one methodology to it, which is pick a number, literally it could be any number, and prepare a budget and turn it into your beneficiary. Since the city or the municipality is the beneficiary of most of these trusts, all these trusts usually do is prepare a very small budget and then send it into the beneficiary, which is literally them themselves. They're not subject to a budget calendar like the city is. They're not subject to a budget format like the city is. And they have very little rules from the budget perspective. If they go over their budget, there's no penalty for it. There's no amendments to the budget. Whereas in the city side, you are literally cuffed every way you go. You can amend it, but you have to have a vote of the council to amend it or uh, an appropriation approved by a manager or an administrator but you can't increase revenues, you can't increase expenses without first going back to the city council. You have to follow a very strict budget calendar. It's gonna be adopted at least two weeks before the uh, budget actually takes effect. And again, all of that structure and law relates to how the city budgets the city's funds and not relates to, it does not relate to how the public trust works and how the public trust budgets its funds. So again, you're in charge of both of these as a mayor in many, many cases. Now, since we've talked about funds and we've talked a little bit about accounting, let's go back and revisit the fund issue. Funds are simply a way that a government keeps track of certain monies. Primarily, most governments have two really large funds, really large operating funds. When we call them the general fund, which usually runs the city, and then we usually call the utility fund or the public works fund an enterprise fund which runs those business type operations such as utilities. Those are where the majority of the employees are recorded, where their pay is recorded, where the bulk of the city uh, and public trust expends its money. Now, you may have other funds. I've seen governments in the past, moderate sized governments, uh, you know, middle of the road population governments like McAllister and El Reno and Enid, where you might have 60 or 70 different funds, two of them your main operating funds, and then 67 other funds that account for anything from a special donation that was made for a restricted purpose, or a special revenue stream from the state or the county, like a street and alley tax. The thing about the special funds is that they have, that money has to be held and used for something very specific. Uh, I'd use the word restricted, but in the accounting vernacular, we use terms like not just restricted, but money that's committed, assigned, uh, or, or non-expendable, not just restricted. The whole point is they are constrained for a special purpose. So you'll see when you budget these funds that you might be adopting dozens of budgets simply because every one of those funds will have a small slice of revenue and then that money will have to be spent in accordance with its designated or restricted or committed purpose. And so that takes us into why you see so many different financial statements and so many different reports. If that equation that I had showed you earlier, the one plus 10, minus 10 equals one. If you only had to see that once, I think you might understand it much better. But imagine having to see that 69 times, all with different numbers, all representing different funds. And again, that is what fund accounting is. Well, who tells us how to do this fund accounting? 
Well, there's actually a board. It's called the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, which uses the acronym of GASB. The GASB sets what we call generally accepted accounting principles. Those are the principles that governments follow in which they prepare their annual financial statements for users, such as banks or creditors or citizens or even management themselves. Now, here in Oklahoma, we have a, a little bit of a unique issue in that we're not required by law to follow the GASB. If a local community says, you know what, we're not borrowing any money, we don't have a lot of reserves, we don't have a lot of users of financial statements, I think I'm going to prepare my annual financial statements on a cash basis. Cash in and cash out would represent my revenues and my expenditures. That's perfectly fine. You get a choice here in Oklahoma, so you might see that your government's annual financial statements might be prepared on a cash basis, might be on a modified cash basis, which is literally the cash basis plus a couple of adjustments, or you might be following what we call the GAAP basis, the G-A-A-P, that spells GAAP, and that are the, those are the principles that are issued by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, also known as GASB. For example, one issue that's hot on the table right now with the GASB relates to unfunded liabilities of government pension plans. And in the past, governments have simply footnoted the amount of underfunded liabilities in the financial statements, but have never really taken the number and, and worked it into the math of the balance sheet or the math of the column. We've never really shown that number as a liability. Well, beginning in fiscal 15 and from that point forward, all of the governments who participate in their own pension plans or they participate in statewide pension plans like the police pension system of the state or the fire pension of the state or even the school uh, teacher retirement system of the state will notice that they have all been allocated a share of that unfunded liability. And those liabilities are dramatic. Um, for example, uh, the teachers system of the, all the school districts in the state of Oklahoma that follow GAP, they've basically been allocated a proportionate share of about a five to seven billion dollar liability. That's billion as in B. So imagine what your balance sheet would look like if you show maybe just a little bit of reserves at the end of the year and then next year I come in and say, well, not only has your reserve gone away, it's now negative because I had to put in a $300 million share of an unfunded liability of the state's pension plan. Now, you can imagine the municipalities are going to scream, the school districts are going to scream, everybody's going to scream, but that's who sets the accounting, and if you're following those rules, you have to apply it in that manner. And so that may be one reason why many governments in Oklahoma, many municipalities, don't choose to follow GAAP and instead prepare cash basis financial statements. And again, I don't think there's anything wrong with cash basis financial statements as long as the users of those statements are, are rather limited. I know management and I know citizens can understand cash basis very well, but when we start getting into complex accounting such as unfunded pension liabilities, it kind of starts to cloud the equation a little bit. And so at the end of the year, every government prepares a, a set of financial statements and they hire an outside auditor. That auditor though may not actually do what you think they're doing. The auditors that you're hiring to audit your annual financial statements are really not conducting a fraud investigation. They're not looking for stolen money. They are little, literally hired to do one thing. And that one thing is to basically look at your financial statements and give you an opinion as to whether or not the financial statements are free of material misstatement. In other words, I'm looking at your numbers for receivables and for cash and for accounts payable, and I think they're relatively okay. I don't think they're materially misstated. Now, as a byproduct of those audits, you'll receive a couple of reports from your auditor. One is a report on internal control, where they look at who's reconciling cash, how is it being reconciled, what internal controls we have in place, and if they see any deficiencies, they'll write them down in that letter and they'll give them to you as a finding. The other letter that we receive from auditors is when you have what's called a single audit. 
And although the single audit tries to imply that there's just one single audit, I want you to think of a single audit not as a single audit, but as a dual audit. Because in every single audit, there's not just one audit going on, there are two audits going on. There's an audit of your financial statements and whether or not they are fairly presented and free of material misstatement. And there's also an audit of compliance with federal dollars going on, which is the single audit component. Both audits have their own opinions, they have their own reports and their own set of findings. So sometimes when you see findings, you've got to discern whether they're financial statement related findings or whether they are single uh, audit related findings. And that gets me into the last thing I want to talk about. These opinions that the auditors issue, up until basically last year, we used terms that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Professionally, I would basically try to explain it as whether or not I received a clean opinion, but the word clean is not found anywhere in professional literature. Instead, we use the word, or we used the word, unqualified. Now, think for just a second. If I were to hand you something and say, here's your unqualified audit, you would initially think, well, that can't be good, because if I ever hire anybody that's unqualified, that's a bad thing except in the world of accounting and audit, which it's flipped. Unqualified is good, qualified is bad. And I know that makes no sense, but that's the way it's been up until last year when they decided that, you know what, there is a lot of confusion about qualified and unqualified, so let's clear it up and let's use different words. The words they chose to use now are modified and unmodified, which really doesn't help a whole lot. But where you want to go is you want to have an unmodified opinion. Think of unmodified or unqualified as a clean audit opinion. That's what you're striving for. Let's talk a little bit more about the budget process and how it starts, how it evolves through the year, and also how it ends. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, we talk about a budget calendar. Uh, a budget calendar that sets out dates of certain points in time depending on what our fiscal year is whether we're June 30 fiscal years like most of the governments in Oklahoma, or perhaps you're a 1231 or maybe even a few 930s. Regardless of when that period is, you've got to start a budget process about four months before that fiscal year is over and the new one begins. And it starts with workshops. It starts with the city manager preparing budget estimates or the city treasurer or the finance director preparing revenue estimates and expenditure estimates and basically culminates in several different meetings. Uh, there must be a public hearing held where the citizens have input into the budget process. Uh, we adopt both revenue estimates and expenditure uh, limits and then again we take those revenue estimates and expenditure limits and we monitor those throughout the year. Very simply, if half the year is over, one could have expected to collect half of the revenue they had estimated and maybe spend approximately half of what they had spent. If you're running ahead or behind the budget, we should be able to explain those things. Now, let's talk about the expenditure side for a second. This is probably one that you as mayor uh, have a little bit more insight into or control over. The revenue streams, you don't really have a lot of control over. You're gonna live and die mostly on sales tax uh, and or your business type activities such as utilities. So the more that people buy things within city limits, the more sales tax you collect, the more money you can spend, the more people use your utility system, the more revenues you collect there. However, in the expenditure side or the expense side of the process, you're gonna notice that every meeting or every other meeting or maybe one meeting a month you'll probably have something similar to a claims list provided to you or a list of all of the expenditures that are either waiting approval for payment or if you've developed your own purchasing ordinance in lieu of state law, then perhaps they've already paid those claims that month and then they are letting you know which claims are being paid. That's where you exercise a little bit of control over. In other words, since you have appropriated those funds to be spent in that budget throughout the year, you're going to see various vendors and various claims presented to you throughout the year and, and either ask for an affirmation of approval or ask for approval to pay that claim itself. And those come to you in the form of purchase orders in many cases, purchase requisitions, 
Uh, you may get a stack of things uh, that are all stapled together like an invoice and a purchase order or a purchase requisition. Or you may simply get a computer page printout of every check you're writing, every invoice, every vendor and what those dollar amounts are. That's where you have a little bit of question making and control over the process to just make sure that all of these are falling with, within those budgeted categories. In fact, one of the limitations on a city is that it can't literally spend more in the department level total than what was originally appropriated without someone performing an amendment. Maybe that amendment can be done by the manager or the finance director, or maybe it's an amendment that has to go in front of council. But that's how you control the appropriation process. In our example earlier when we're talking about 10 as being our appropriated uh, expense or expenditure number, we're going to control that throughout the year so that make sure that, you know, come April or May or June, if we're at a June 30 year end, that we're not already over that expenditure limit or, or going to be over it at the end of the year. And so we can either amend that budget or cut back other expenses or perhaps raise new revenues if we need to. But that is the budget process. That's what you should expect to see. Now, we talk a lot about the budget and the budget being the controlling document of the governing body. Once the year is over, the budget means nothing because there's going to be a new budget that starts in the next year. But what follows the budget is very important, and that's what's called the audit. And again, the audit is going to be conducted by a CPA, by a firm that's qualified or registered with the state auditor's office to do audits of municipalities in the state of Oklahoma. And what you'll see is that depending on what fiscal year end you have, say June 30 or 12, 31, the auditors are going to, you're going to see a lot of them after that point in time. In fact, you'll see so much of them that they have to file that audit report within six months of the close of your fiscal year with the state auditor's office. So every community has with the state auditor a filing requirement of their audit within six months of the year. So for your June 30 year ends, that's 1231. For you 1231s, that's June 30. And then again, if you're a different fiscal year, you can just calculate when that deadline is. So if you're a new mayor and you're coming into this process and you'd sure like to see what audits of your community looked like last year or the year before, maybe the best place to go look for it is at the state auditor's office because if you've been filing them on time, then the state auditor's office will have a copy of every one of those audits as far back as probably you would like uh, to see. Okay, so there it is. The world of accounting and auditing from the Oklahoma municipality perspective. Hopefully the information I've shown you today gives you a little bit better feel for both the accounting and the audit side. I know being a mayor uh, in Oklahoma is a huge role and I for one want to say thank you from somebody who knows what such uh, an incredible role and incredible amount of time that you put into being the mayor. So I would like to thank you for your service. And again, if there are any questions, please see information on uh, the screen and uh, hopefully that will help answer your questions. Thank you.